Selling concert tickets is not especially hard. Despite what your $20 service fee would suggest, on a scale of difficult problems to solve, it lies somewhere between light bulb installation and check cashing. The only remotely hard part, you might say a ticketing company's one job, is to handle the extremely predictable surge of traffic the day Taylor Swift tickets go on sale. So, of course, that's exactly what Ticketmaster failed spectacularly at during her most recent Eras Tour presale. Traumatized fans told stories of $200 service fees, cryptic error messages, and $50,000 seats. Most left with nothing to show for their eight hours of fighting in the trenches. Others felt like lottery winners simply for having been granted the privilege of paying five, six, or nine hundred dollars for nosebleeds. But although demand for this tour could hardly have been higher, there's nothing new about the unpleasantness of buying tickets. When service fees commonly cost more than the actual seat, it's no surprise America's hatred of Ticketmaster makes Comcast look favorable. How does the company get away with it? Because, common sense would say, they can. Ticketmaster is so deeply embedded in the industry that it's nearly impossible for large artists to avoid. Of Taylor Swift's 52 upcoming shows, for instance, it sold the tickets for 47. Not only does it sell twice as many tickets as its closest competitor, StubHub, but it also represents performers, owns venues, and acts as a promoter. All of this is 100% true. And yet, it's not the reason service fees are astronomical, scalping is rampant, or buying tickets just generally sucks. Sponsored by Audible. Listen to Ticketmasters, The Rise of the Concert Industry and How the Public Got Scalped, or one of thousands of other great audiobooks for free with the link in the description. What's the right price for a product? Ask the seller and they'll tell you that's easy. The right price is the one people are willing to pay. Entire careers and disciplines exist for the sole purpose of finding that number with penny precision. And because price has the largest impact on profit, more so than production costs or even volume sold, the science of pricing has gotten pretty darn good. Through surveys, trends, and algorithms, companies systematically deconstruct the value consumers place on each feature. A $3 gallon of milk might derive 30 cents of its value from being reduced fat, and a nickel from its packaging. They can then use those values to determine the theoretical price of a new product, or a matrix of products with different combinations of features. Concerts, on the other hand, are just about the opposite of milk. Not only are they an experience, but they're also highly emotionally charged. Besides, no two shows are the same. Taylor Swift will only ever play the Eras Tour in Kansas City on July 7th, once. Now, none of this would phase an economist. After all, there are many one-of-a-kind products. Houses, paintings, and used cars, for example. When you don't know the consumer's willingness to pay, the simple Econ 101 solution is to force them to reveal it. In other words, an auction. All the technology required to double or triple Taylor Swift's profit overnight existed on eBay in 1995. The problem, of course, is that artists are in the business of cultivating goodwill. These higher prices would effectively exclude many of their biggest fans, bruising their image and limiting the long-term growth of their fan base. Take a second to appreciate what this means. Instead, artists artificially price their tickets hundreds or even thousands of dollars below market value. 
We know this because the same tickets are immediately resold for many multiples of their original price. Remember, from a purely economic perspective, the right price is the one people are willing to pay. And a natural consequence is the opportunity for scalpers to buy low and sell high. If Taylor Swift won't charge what she's worth, some random dude in Romania is more than happy to do it for her. At the same time, artists are also in the business of making money. They still want to capture some of that extra value. And one of the ways they balance these two competing interests is by secretly withholding many of their best seats. Some of these holds may be given to friends and family. Others, however, are sold directly to brokers who turn around and sell them to you at the prevailing market rate. In 2011, Katy Perry's contract was leaked to the public, revealing that she, like many musicians, did just that. In other words, artists get to have their cake and eat it too, protecting their image with affordable primary ticket sales while profiting off far more expensive secondary sales. Now, you might argue that artists themselves are victims of the larger industry, one they have no choice but to participate in. This is true. Unless Taylor Swift wants to play for crowds of 800 people at the Timbuktu County Fair, Ticketmaster is effectively the only game in town. That's because it signs three to five year exclusive contracts with the vast majority of large desirable venues. All the star power of Sinatra, Elvis, and Lennon combined would be worthless against these airtight contracts. If you want to play at these venues, which for the most popular artists really means play at all, Ticketmaster comes with them. But what critics of the company often miss by fixating on its monopoly is the question, why? Why do companies sign these exclusive deals with Ticketmaster? Once upon a time, ticketing was a cost for venues a service like security that they outsource to the lowest bidder. What Ticketmaster did, its innovation, if you can call it that, was approach these venues with an offer. What if, instead of you paying us, we paid you? Sure, part of the reason Ticketmaster got so big was by swallowing up its competitors, but it also did so by promising to make concert venues more money. For cash-strapped public stadiums especially, this guaranteed source of revenue proved irresistible. It did this with the two most hated words in the English language, service fees. Every show is different, but these fees are typically shared between some combination of Ticketmaster, the venue, promoter, and or artist. The truth, though it pains me to say this, is that the vast majority of Ticketmaster's customers love it. It's just that we are not its customers. We are just collateral damage caught in a web of intermediaries fighting to capture the value of live music. That's what the Justice Department decided in 1995 after a years-long investigation, that its true customers were perfectly happy with the status quo. A decade later, a federal district court in California reached the same conclusion. There's no doubt Ticketmaster wields far more control than any one company should have over the music industry. In fact, since it merged with Live Nation in 2010, Ticketmaster itself owns many of the venues that granted exclusivity. These things are easy to understand. What's not as well understood is that greater competition isn't, in this case, an effective solution. Remember, ticketing companies compete to give more money to venues in the form of service fees. Split Ticketmaster in two and they would bid service fees up, not down. Yes, the company's vertical integration, spanning venues, promotion, ticketing, and managing is incredibly concerning. 
But let's not forget that it had no trouble securing these exclusive contracts well before it merged with Live Nation in 2010. In 1994, for instance, it had exclusive deals with 63% of American arenas and concert halls. Now, if any of this surprised you, that's the point. If you assumed service fees were entirely the fault of Ticketmaster, you are proof that the company doesn't just skim profit. It also offers a valuable service. What Ticketmaster is, is a reputational shield. Ticketing is the ugly part of the business, the business part of the business. So artists who don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole outsource it. The implicit agreement is that while fees get spread around, Ticketmaster alone takes the hit. And when fans can't get seats, it's Ticketmaster who delivers the bad news. But the critical thing to not lose sight of is that above all these intermediaries is the only absolute unbreakable monopoly, the artist. Though he may be on all our iPhones, there's only one Bono. The top 1% of artists negotiate from a position of extraordinary strength. This may sound like an obvious truism. The most popular artists are powerful, duh but it's something fans, in their eagerness to forgive their heroes, often forget. Consider, for instance, how they get paid. Artists, through their agents, who typically take a percentage of their earnings, are approached by a promoter. Promoters are the heart of the whole operation. Beyond managing, scheduling, and yes, promoting, by far their most important role is to underwrite the event. While artists receive a guarantee, an upfront fee for their performance, say a million dollars, the promoter may make more than a million dollars, or they may make far less. They assume that risk. The most popular musicians, confident in their ability to attract crowds, often choose a percentage of the door instead. And the higher their guarantee or percentage, the less money is left over for everyone else. When top artists can demand as much as 105%, more than the total ticket sales, it's no wonder these costs eventually ripple down to you and I in the form of $12 pretzels and $50 service fees. It had to come from somewhere. And that's just one part of the contract. Musicians also help determine ticket prices, fees, pre-sale requirements, and whether or not to use dynamic pricing, which adjusts prices algorithmically. This is not at all to paint artists as the villains and Ticketmaster as an innocent scapegoat. They're all complicit to varying degrees. But if your goal is to effect change, calling for the breakup of Ticketmaster is more a satisfying method of venting frustration than it is an effective solution. The real hope lies with the artist, the party both with the most power and the one most responsive to fans. It may not be the musician's fault that the industry is what it is, but if anyone can negotiate on behalf of all of us, it's Taylor Swift who in 2015 almost single-handedly changed how artists are paid on Apple Music, and more recently fought back against her own record label. Just as the costs imposed by the top 1% of artists ripple down to the rest of us, these privileged few can also set better terms that benefit everyone. Music history is filled with exactly that, bands standing up for their fans, sometimes to borderline comical degrees. When the jam band The String Cheese Incident was refused the right to sell its own tickets in the early 2000s, it threatened to hand out cash to thousands of volunteers who would go buy them on their behalf at the box office, which was exempt from service fees. The Grateful Dead, likewise, fought Ticketmaster for the right to sell half its tickets directly to fans. In order to prevent scalpers from buying more than the permitted number of tickets, it would spread thousands of order slips on the floor and look for duplicate handwriting. 
These and countless other stories I learned while reading Ticketmasters, the rise of the concert industry and how the public got scalped, which you can listen to on today's sponsor, Audible. It tells the full, fascinating story of how ticketing went from a system of regional monopolies maintained by promoters to the modern online monopoly we know today. Along the way, you learn things like why one of Ticketmaster's first customers was the Norwegian government, who wanted to design a more equitable, socialized distribution of tickets. Now, the worst feeling in the world is getting a chapter into a book, realizing it's not really for you, and feeling like you have to keep reading. The reason I love Audible is that you can always return a book and choose a new one. I've done it probably a dozen times. With an Audible membership, you get one credit a month to listen to any of its thousands of great audiobooks. They also have exclusive shows and podcasts. Visit audible.com slash polymatter, click the link in the description, or text polymatter to 500-500, that's P-O-L-Y-M-A-T-T-E-R, to 500-500 to get one free audiobook of your choice and start listening today.